Okay, so welcome all to the seminar today. And uh, we got a few glitches, but we got started finally. And uh, today will be another talk on operator algebras and pulse reconstruction in holography. And this is so our speaker today is Monica Jin Wu Kang from Caltech. He's a postdoc there, and she has written this very interesting paper on this subject. Um, uh, so we are very uh, so over to you, Monica, to tell us about this work. Thank you for the uh, invitation and the nice opportunity to speak here. Um, today I'll talk about the non perturbative gravity corrections to bulk reconstruction. It'll be based on this paper uh, with my collaborating student, Elliot Justo. Um, and today, as uh, I am nicely told to uh, introduce me, um, that it'll be taking operator algebraic perspective meaning we're going to try to incorporate these uh, gravity corrections through the scope to anal analyze with the uh, operator algebra as an algebraic perspective to what to incorporate and what we can learn thereof from the uh, bulk reconstruction. And as, uh, as a high energy theorist, you're always uh, interested in holography. I wanna really start the talk by uh, presenting you this very beautiful uh, picture that I took at a local museum in Korea, um, I really think that captures our holography nicely. It has some a very uh, complicated system in the bulk that's very uh, intertwined with a lot of gravity and, and uh, further stuff that we have to consider. But when we're projecting it, which is really uh, enlightening as an isometric map for, as a bulk to boundary as a holographic map that we're going to take, we can understand more of a refined structure that contains definitely more uh, structure than the bulk thereof. And by having this perspective, we can retreat back to understand what we learn about the bulk. And that is what we're really going to do today. By that, we're going to really understand operator algebra perspective by taking the operators in the bulk in the semi-classical regime to uh, give rise to the bulk conformal field theory. So thus the operators in this uh, conformal field theory algebra so that uh, we will express these and understand the better and what can be gained in this perspective about the information that is physically relevant, such as relative entropy and um, various other things. And for that, we're going to start by how we're going to really view these uh, bulk operators in this uh, holographic map to the uh, boundary CFT. Well, in this perspective, then holography tells you that any local bulk operators can be expressed as the boundary operators that's smeared over the entire spatial slice or, or a compact spatial subregion. And we are going to understand these operators taking the uh, scope of not only the operator algebra, but in the scope of a quantum error correction. So we're going to utilize a perspective how to take these into account as a Hilbert space setting of uh, the code of subspace, which will be my next slide, where we are going to now focus on this perspective of quantum error correction. So by taking these modern informator theoretic, information theoretic type of formalism, we can now understand these local bulk operators as in the uh, particular the code subspace. Well, the code subspace of the theory is then seen as a uh, vector space that's isometrically embedded to the physical Hilbert space of quantum gravity in this context. So that um, in the, uh, particularly for like finite dimensional hyperspace, this has been actively studied through the scope of Rutek and Negus surface. And for this particular setup, um, bulk reconstruction is then uh, can be seen as the existence of operators that's acting in the physical Hilbert space that reproduces the action of operators acting on the code subspace, which will be the really the formalism we're gonna take throughout the talk. So that the, when I say code subspace, it'll really get, writ, be written as the H code, and that'll be the one tagging for the uh, bulk Hilbert space region. Whereas um, the boundary will be taken as a physical qubits over there, and that's going to be H physics, and that'll be the CFT that's corresponding and um, as the Hilbert space over there. And as I was just mentioning, you're going to be looking into uh, this type of um, modern information theoretic understanding whereas the operators that we're gonna take into will be the one that's giving rise to algebraic perspective. Then what type of algebra does it really need to be understood? 
we're going to really understand as a local operator algebra for a, a given quantum field theory in the semi-classical setting. As much as I want to understand full-blown quantum gravity setting, that is impossible to really understand fully. So we're going to take it in the semi-classical setting so that we're going to fix the metrics of the gravities and then have the full quantum interaction and fluctuations that can be taken into so that we're going to understand as a semi-classical quantum field theory for the bulk and the uh, boundary will be completely a conformal field theory that's fully quantum mechanical. Um, and for these, uh, von Neumann algebra sounds quite the mouthful, but uh, it's nothing really that difficult to really look into. In fact, it's uh, simpler than DOAs that's been used in string theory for over the many years. Um, and von Neumann algebra is basically given as the set of bounded operators at a given Hilbert space that we're going to be looking into. So that if you're looking into the bulk region, then you're going to look into the code, the subspace, Hilbert space in the bulk, and that's going to give rise to the uh, Hilbert space. And that's going to be the one giving rise to the von Neumann algebra that lies within the Hilbert space. And you can do the same analysis for the control field theory thereof. So that we'll be having von Neumann algebras of the bulk and the uh, boundary separately. Um, the von Neumann algebra can be also have a commutant, which really gives you a scope that it is the nicest one to look into from a holographic perspective, which can be defined as the ones that's commuting with respect to the ones within the von Neumann algebra that you're taking all the commuting operators and combining it together. So then von Neumann algebra is like a naturally giving you the identity and that's the one of the things that's required to have for such. And uh, it requires two more conditions to be called von Neumann algebra, which is actually also the reason why we are choosing a von Neumann algebra to be of interest. The first condition that's needed is that it's closed under Hermitian conjugation. So that means we're really in the quantum mechanical interaction regime and that's what we want to take to understand any quantum field theory. And the second one is that it's double commutant map back to itself. So what it means is that when you're taking a particular space and the commutant will give rise to the other part, and that's going to be giving also as a von Neumann algebra. And when it's commutant back, we would naively then want to have the original space back and the original uh, region that you're we really interested in. And the von Neumann algebra is the algebra that will allow you to have such a, a property. So von Neumann algebra is very nice and a natural way to understand from holographic perspective. And it's also very nice because it's a natural way to describe um, truly quantum field theory in the sense that it can effectively work with infinite dimensional Hilbert space. As quantum field theory has a continuous spectrum, um, you're not necessarily or will never really have an infinite, a finite dimensional Hilbert space, but will always be given with the infinite dimensional Hilbert space with the continuing spectrum, um, unless you're regulating. So if you want to understand anything like non-regulated true quantum field theory in, from the operator's perspective, then what you really have to consider is the infinite dimensional hyperspace. And uh, von Neumann algebras are understood in both contexts, and uh, everything that I'm going to talk today will apply to both setups, but with the emphasis that it can be also be generalized and is understood in infinite dimensional hyperspace in particular. Just to stress this point a little further, it really needs to be in the infinite dimensional system together if you want to have a quantum field theory that's going to be analyzed with respect to a riesz leader theorem, which is coming from the Whiteman axiom. And for the theories that's compatible with the riesz leader theorem, requires a huge amount of entanglement. So what is actually the uh, precise statement of the riesz leader theorem? Well, one way to precisely capture it is the one that I wrote here, so that we're considering a particular region that, that I wrote as capital A, and by acting on the vacuum, as quantum field theory is always naturally having a vacuum, or it can have many, but it needs to have a vacuum always, then we can act on this vacuum with many operators on top of that, in that open region of the neighborhood, and then by acting on the located in that very region of A, we should be able to then reproduce all the set of states, which is dense in the full Hilbert space of this very quantum field theory. That means that you really need to uh, have a huge, enormous amount of entanglement contained therein 
because uh, to borrow Ed Witten's word, uh, one way to really say this is that you can um, act in the Jupiter and recreate the whole universe. Now, if you're thinking like in condensed matter system perspective, like in the uh, lattice theory, and you would not really see this because it's explicitly finite and you would not be able to have that much of an entanglement to really create the whole thing. So uh, it's a generic full spectrum of the quantum field theory. We really need to have a infinite dimensional Hilbert space to have something compatible thereof. And uh, having reached your leader theorem um, is also very nice in a sense that we can have a vacua as written as a cyclic and separating state. And then you can have a suitable local operator, all of them acting on them, then the local operator giving rise to the quantum field theory, then you can naturally obtain a then subset of the Hilbert space. So what is this cyclic and separating state and why is that really important to have this and can be interpreted as a vacua? Well, first of all, separating just means that uh, you can have a von Neumann algebra that's mapping to the Hilbert space as a von Neumann algebra is a bounded operator set of the Hilbert space. Of course, it needs to have a Hilbert space information already and one can always write this map so that in quantum mechanics, you can write it just as this. Then this particular state is separating if this map is injective, meaning its kernel is explicitly zero. And this is actually expected because as a holographic map, you want to always match the spectra of the bulk theory and the spectra of the CFT. And this is what we always see in like an ADS5 CFT4 or many others. Um, when the spectra is explicitly different, then we cannot really understand them as explicitly dual theories. And what it really means here is that we can have this one-to-one -one map, so we can have the spectrum to be identical. So in a sense, that just means that you're having a holographic map. And what is cyclic? Well, cyclic is important because uh, this one is basically meaning that this uh, Hilbert space is a closure of this image. Another way of saying that is, that is that it is not quite surjective. Now, if it's entirely surjective, that would not be really uh, possible because um, the bulk theory is way more complicated. It's containing much more complexity and much more information as there is dynamical degrees of, of gravity. Whereas the boundary is a much nicer picture as it has additional conformal symmetry and that's decoupled from the gravity sector. So in turn, if it's completely surjective, there'll be identical theory with the identical amount of information and we know that that is not the case. So that we want some sort of sort of understanding between the two. So it's uh, now uh, not quite surjective. And combining the two, this gives the vacua understanding as this state that'll generate these Hilbert spaces. And this will be uh, ensuring that we'll have a holographic map between the uh, bulk Hilbert space and the uh, boundary CFT Hilbert space. So what it really means is that if the uh, physical content of the spatial leader theorem is relevant for the bulk, then the bulk reconstruction that we're going to consider needs to be understood explicitly in the infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces without actually regulating from this perspective. So then I want to really now give rise to why we can understand these uh, in quantum field theory and how despite having this algebraic approach, Whereas earlier, we have this Ryu-Takanek understanding, which is really coming from an uh, emergent space-time perspective and how it's coming from the geodesic. So we really need to have to understand the space-time geometric theory from the bulk perspective. And I will try to now explain you how um, von Neumann algebra, despite being an algebra itself, it understands some sort of geometric information of the space-time theory. So I want to define an open region of space-time as U for convenience. Then we can define an associated local al operator algebra in that very open space-time region. Then I'm going to call it as A of U. And of course, it's an as associated any local operator algebra. So they are generally unbounded as an operator. Now, earlier, I was telling you that the von Neumann algebra is a set of bounded operators. So we need to now sec select the bounded operators only and generate that set that's narrowly uh, depending on this open region of the space time. Now, for any quantum mechanical operators, we can definitely do a polar decomposition. 
So through polar decomposition, we're going to get a partial isometry and a uh, self-adjoint positive operator. Now, self-adjoint positive operator will be a canonically associated with a set of projections via spectral theorem. So what we really have through polar decomposition are the information of a partial isometry and a set of all projections. Now, these are enough to not generate back with this information to give rise to a set of bounded operators. So that von Neumann algebra is explicitly generated by the partial isometries associated the operators in here and the, uh, this set of all projections, which will then denote the subregions of the bulk and the boundary. So in turn, we can have the von Neumann algebra, which is completely algebraic approach, but it'll have understanding of where it was uh, describing under as the uh, um, region of the space-time. So in turn, we, this is also very important why we needed the double commutant back, mapping back to as well, because that understand which geometric segment of the bulk you're associated with and what will be the one that's corresponding under as like a CFT perspective in the boundary as well. Uh, sorry, I have a very nice question here because I'm not, okay. um, I'm I, I, uh, it's not, I don't have so much of understanding of one dimensional algebra. So, uh, well, what do you mean by a projection here actually? Because I thought that the main, one of the content of the Riesz-Hitler theorem would be that you cannot really localize states. Ah, the projections are smeared projections because you're actually really requiring a smeared way of having an open region of the space time. But oh, what okay. it really you means that you can have projection. the projection matrices are definitely mm -hmm. possible, and then you can act on them to the uh, operator algebra operators within that neighborhood, open neighborhood of that yeah. region. Uh, I see, but uh, you cannot really project states into like subregions in a very sharp way, right? It should be like very smeared projection. We can have subregions; it just uh, have to be in the uh, that open neighborhood. So that it really have to be an open region that it can tag under. So you can have a code out subspace. And that can be a subregion that we're really dealing with. And that one, you can definitely uh, have it as the uh, set of projections over there. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is where my confusion is. When you talk about projection, you mean the con projection of the algebra or the state? Because I thought the state itself cannot be. Uh, projections of algebra. The projection of the algebra. OK, then I understand. OK, I see. Okay. Yeah, not a state. Oh, yeah, that's, that's very, no, that's not the case. OK, thanks. No problem. So what I really uh, want to convey coming from this aspect is that von Neumann algebra understand the space-time of the theory. And uh, then having the space-time theory in the bulk as that we are really trying to understand is semi-classical bulk, then maybe then effectively be described from this algebraic setup as a local operator algebra of the uh, quantum field theory of the semi-classical theory. Um, and that will be on a, a curved global ADS background. And the von Neumann algebras can be then associated to describe any subregion that's covariantly defined in the bulk. So that, that can be understood as an entangled wedge in respect as a HKLL protocol of a boundary subregion, which is causally complete and will then naturally have an associated von Neumann algebra. So that the picture I really want to first have that's going to uh, be now incorporated afterwards in the end as a goal is with the non perturbative corrections onto. But before that is uh, this particular slide here. Um, now, what I'm telling you here is uh, true in respect to 1 over G Newton, meaning it's a quote unquote exact equivalence between the two. Um, so earlier, I was mentioning from the finite dimensions uh, from the root Tachanagi surface, it really effectively understood that geometrically what will be. Uh, the entanglement wedge, and also the uh, possible um, the understanding of the of the uh, um, the geometry and geodesic of the bulk. So, what is really the Ruta-Kernaghi formula? Well, Ruta-Kernaghi formula basically relates the uh, generalized entropy of a semi-classical bulk state of the ADS CFT to the entanglement entropy of the uh, corresponding boundary state. So, um, to really think of that in mind. Um, this can be utilized to really actually in retrospect define and understand to provide the emergent space time coming thereof as an entangled wedge. Well, so let's first consider an explicit uh, schematic diagram here. That's a schematic diagram. So it's just supposed to be understood 
as like a simple perspective. So let's define this region capital A on the boundary in the CFT in a given state that possesses a semi-classical dual that corresponds to this bulk region called the entangle wedge. And um, that's you know, denoted as this uh, small a. Um, and this for the entangle wedge whose uh, geometry and field content are then solely in this uh, boundary region capital A. So then given the uh, bulk geometry, the entangle wedge that we have here for a given boundary region is then determined through the uh, minimization pro pro protocol so that it is delimited by a quantum extremal surface homologous to uh, the boundary region, this capital A. And that's why we call Ruchak and Nagy surface the minimal surface, as this is physically the minimal surface. And as the name suggests, as a quantum extremal surface, it has a property of being an extremum of the generalized entropy of a boundary state that we can write it as here, whereas this is now giving rise as the uh, area of this, which will be given as this, and has additional term. Um, and this term, this is the a state that describes the system in the semi-classical theory. So in here with the quantum information theoretic setting, that is the uh, code subspace. Now, utilizing this was possible explicitly to understand and generating all three different statements to be equivalent is done by Harlow for the um, one up to order of one over G Newton. And these are further generalized to show that these two are equivalent as quantum extremal surface diverges naturally. Um, so such a concept will exist but it's harder to have explicit formula analyzable in that setup. But in the infinite dimensional cases, these two are shown to be equivalent and first here and uh, further generalized to more uh, generic settings in these other two papers. Now, I want to really note that uh, what we know about the entangled wedge is that it can be much larger than the causal wedge, which is the uh, bulk region that's reconstructable uh, through the HKLO protocol. And this can be easily uh, thought of as having, when you're having like a uh, two separate boundary region considered and how then it will always contain causal wedge, but it will be bigger than the uh, causal wedge to be considered. Uh, Monica, can I ask something? And uh, this uh, infinite dimensional generations of this Harlow's proof uh, of the equivalence of these two statements, uh, is it straightforward or it is tricky? Uh, it's very non-trivial because, uh, first of all, in finite dimension, you have trace. What I actually didn't tell you or didn't want to get into is that uh, for generic infinite dimensional vulnerable algebra, there's no notion of trace defined. So uh, things are not like linear algebra anymore. So you really have to go in, uh, fully into Tomita Takasaki theory, and we'll have to incorporate uh, what it means to be relative entropy there and, and uh, generalize it in the in the in like the infinite dimensional setup it's a very different technology so that one you really do need to use von neumann algebra but in the end you don't have any further corrections or any any big or any say for example uh, some corrections that comes from the extremal surface itself or some kind of subtleties that come in no in fact uh, one up so this was shown in a finite dimension the order of one over g newton um and Exactly, they're shown to be proven to be identical as a between mm. the two statements with no additional things. Okay, thank you. No problem. Now, um, ah, yeah, so let's like look a little more into this because I think this is more of uh, giving us how we should uh, proceed to think about um, this among the three. So the validity of this Ruchaka and Nagi formula is uh, then equivalent to these two in, in a sense that entangled wedge reconstruction is then taken to be understood as complete version of the complementary recovery. By that, we can have a map as a holographic map between the two as a quantum channel, which I'll explain later. And a complete version of this complementary recovery is meaning that everything can be recovered is that each, so that um, when the boundary theory, then this capital A in a pure state and this small a, which is an entangled wedge of this boundary region is the one that's explicitly dual to it. And then um, the semi-classical operators in this small a can be reconstructed from the operators that we know from this capital A 
And that's, and then you can do the same for the complements as well. And that's how you can then incorporate this entanglement web reconstruction from purely operator perspective, which understand the space time region where it belongs to. And uh, taking that as one-to-one -one map as a holographic map together, now that give rise to uh, the uh, complementary recovery as this map to be preserved. And, and thus you can have this bulk reconstruction within the region of entanglement wedge. And um, uh, having this, yes? Just one small thing about, so you are talking in this uh, leading order in one of a junior tone, uh, yes. but uh, there would be in principle some kind of uh, corrections to the area like wall, like. So. Uh, that's, that's what we will do with the non perturbative gravity corrections. Uh, what it'll, what we can actually do a little bit better. But uh, thus far up till here, I didn't throw anything further. This is only up to one over G Newton at the moment. Ah, no, no. Even at one over G Newton, you can have the stringy corrections, wall like corrections to the entropy. Like you can have the uh, some uh, curvature of this uh, surface through the Kanagi surface and all of that, right? And these are like stringy corrections. That's what you like in ADS safety, you know, that they have this uh, higher derivative gravity corrections, not really new Newton corrections. Uh, so oh, I you comment on that as like a limitation to this approach and why that really is in the gravity correction more or less and mm. why that's not observed observed in the one of Virginia. Just to give a short answer now as a precursor is that stringy mm. corrections is really depending on this uh, more of a um, when you have this G Newton perturbation is taken into account. It's not apparent in the one of Virginia Newton level is the short answer to it. Mm. Okay, maybe I can ask more later. Sounds good. So as you prepare nicely for it, um, we need to actually understand uh, relative entropy in the context of finite, not only finite dimensional system, but also to the infinite dimensional system. And as I mentioned, the trace is no longer defined. So let's look at what relative entropy really does. Well, Relative entropy does not increase under performing a partial trace on either of the states. The end, then this relative entropy can be really intuitively thought of as a measure of distinguishability between this rho and sigma, those two states. So how do we really generalize this to without using trace as an information, but using Tomita's Takesaki theory to have this incorporated? Well, the short answer is that you can write as this colored region over there. Um, I will not go over the, uh, all the details how you can give rise to it, but you can kind of see that it's basically effectively a trace, but having utilized as the, uh, the states as cyclic and separating so that you have a vacua, and then you have an understanding that can basically recuperate this uh, relative operator um, between the two states, and that's going to give rise to effectively the relative entropy. And in fact, bringing back to finite setup where you can have trace, and then your um, this uh, modular operator can induce back to the uh, uh, density of states, and you recreate this formula of the finite dimensional setup, which confirms that this is indeed the natural or direct generalization to the infinite dimensional setup. Now, in this sense, we can recorporate this equivalent exact setup of the theorem, that's exact meaning order one over G Newton, so that we can have a complete recovery, which was the entanglement wedge reconstruction, to the relative entropy conservation between the bulk and the boundary. So you can show that these are equivalent with this setup, utilizing uh, this relative entropy and having the map as um, the operators all on the boundary and the bulk mapping it back together as a bulk reconstruction. Now, as we were hinting earlier, there are lots of uh, limitations to this exact theorem that's only true, only up to order one of a union. It's this exact approach is insufficient to capture some crucial aspects of the integral wedge reconstruction ADS CFT, because, well, the ADS CFT duality is a large N statement from the uh, CFT perspective. So as this n is taken to be large but finite, there will be then stringy correction to this ideal picture of a reconstruction 
through the through this uh, explicit uh, structure as uh, this particular map we can take, which you will learn later that that will can be considered as a conditional expectation. Um, now, when you're now taking stringing correction, so that it's taking really n as large but finite, this picture explicitly breaks down. Another way or dual statement to say this is that we can make the uh, gn, the Newton's constant, to be finite. And then that breaks the exact quantum error correcting code structure. And by having this then g Newton to be finite and being there, what you really need to now understand is a gravitational correction, meaning that is order of at least one to have this to be incorporated through this uh, correspondence. And that breaks the exact theorem, but that was only true or up to the order of order one over g Newton that it really does not have any understanding even up to order one. Now, that's why this is not just merely a technicality of the limitation. It's more of that um, to really consider this, you have to allow the exponential to uh, G Newton terms so that it'll have incorporation to let it leak through so that the information of leaking is going through as a gravity corrections perspective. And that's going to be taken into as approximate version of the theorem about the correspondence. To so when more... information leaking, you mean that information in the port subspace is leaking out uh, outside of the port subspace? Or is that so the, the information picture? leaking will be through the gravity as the geodesics and everything is through gravity. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's going to be the explicit leaking because you're now having the G Newton constant not like gone so that you have to take order one or any higher terms to consider and especially the order one term is very important as that'll be coming from the string correction as the leading order term um, so it's really effectively thinking as like a, you're not taking a large n limit as like a strictly infinite n limit so like a sufficiently finite but large n it's already breaking down as it was only true of order one over g newton so that this, when you're even allowing this uh, static metric as semi-classical statement that will already break down as gravity will be naturally the leaking procedure. So, but if I understand correctly, this, uh, this, uh, this subspace reconstruction thing, um, and this already assumes that you can have this uh, non perturbative correction. This is always understood in the form like an approximate uh, no, no, no. Uh, non, uh, non perturbative term of any g newton correction will be exponential to the g newton and that'll be higher order of any kind to that and even the jlms formula does not take that into account mm -hmm. so that the yeah, original right. statement no, can never saying... be sufficient to have that information no, I, com I, I agree with it, but uh, if you look into like in the presence of some black hole when you have like two possible surfaces and then you have this uh, some region in space time that uh, that has uh, say a subspace dependent uh, uh, subspace dependent uh, uh, map in that case uh, you use this approximate anything anyway right you have to use this notion of an approximate uh, error correction uh, if you're yes, if you have uh, a you do need to do that and that's the state page dependent uh, this, uh, state right. dependent construction that's what I am alluding to analysis is already not the exact there you're correct mm -hmm. So for the page curve analysis to take into this black hole effect in the middle of the integral wedge staying there succinctly and then looking into the two uh, sided of the uh, boundaries mm -hmm. so through the black hole and having that into account. And the page curve analysis actually when you're taking into account mm -hmm. you take the area operator and then so it's not just a pure JLMS they modify the JLMS formula to take that into account. And that is already not in this exact exact theorem. This exact ah, okay. is so, actually using pure JLMS original formula. Okay, so you're saying that if in the context of say just even for the pure vacuum, there is this problem that you cannot really generalize this. Uh, uh, so then you need a generalization of this setup to even to incorporate it. Okay, thanks. Correct. Right. In fact, those are the ones that's going to be giving rise as this gravitational air to it. So that JLMS needs to be modified, and then of course the entangled wedge needs to be changed. Which actually is a very nice way of bringing up my first point here, is that another elegant way of putting this is that we have the redund redundancy in the bulk to boundary encoding um, can only be really consistent with the ratio later theorem on the boundary. If the entangled wedge reconstruction is actually then approximate, 
then you need an error that may be actually be explicitly non perturbative in genome so that it'll be the same statement that uh, QFT is reissue leader theorem uh, satisfying, then you absolutely actually need the non perturbative order of genome. Um, and another following up statement is that for a state independent recovery to be really possible in this very approximate setting, so that you can consider with the presence of black hole of this uh, non perturbative gravitational errors, then a local bulk operator has to be in the entangled wedge of all the pure and mixed states. Whereas before, you're only considering the pure states only of the corresponding boundary region. So by having these pure and mixed states, all of them in entangled wedge together, you're really considering the jumps of the quantum um, extremal surfaces. And in order to really composite them all together to understand the region that is bulk reconstructable with that, we'll be, uh, we're going to use the concept of reconstruction wedge. I will actually define what that is in this context and we'll utilize how to uh, have this theorem to be now instead of entangled wet reconstruction, it'll be a reconstruction wet, which is a smaller region, as you can imagine. Now, by having the presence of these non perturbative errors is kind of a crucial, as you were pointing it out, so that uh, when you want to do the black hole information paradox or anything that's uh, explicitly gravitational path and go heavy with the black holes, then you would absolutely need to consider them as the JLMS itself of the relative entropy is no longer explicitly conserved. So how do we really then use this algebraic approach to understand them? Well, there we have built like an explicit dictionary between the two. And what we're really going to utilize is having this now von Neumann algebra setup for the boundary and bulk. We're going to take now projections of those, which will be the one that's really giving you the original picture of a nice museum of art that was showing as the projection. And that will be the one also giving you as a conditional expectation that's going to give rise to the uh, this holographic understanding of the map. So that invariance under those will be the uh, really explicit the bulk reconstruction that we had as entanglement wet reconstruction. So from them, what is this explicit conditional expectation to really understand that? Well, Let's say we have a positive linear map, and these two are the von Neumann algebras, then it has identity kept. And you can see that from here, from BAC acting on all of them, it's now only acting on A inside. I mean, any, it's really just equivalent to uh, tracing out of degrees of freedom. So we can imagine of a setting that an observer may only have an access to part of the information contained in the quantum system. So like it's the same system as to consider a code subspace in the bulk. So we can have the code subalgebra as the one that we're going to consider as this neighborhood. And thankfully, because one Neumann algebra understand which region that we are looking onto, so we can have the code subspace algebra directly tagged on there. And that's what we can really understand as taking the degree out. And this is the part that we will take it invariant so that we'll have an entangled wedge to be bulk reconstructable. So then utilizing this uh, algebraic method, what can you really do to understand the non-perturbative gravity corrections? Well, let's try to then understand in the setup how we can usually understand from before is that we divide it into two subregions. So the boundary can have capital A and the capital A bar. Now, coming from here, uh, we can um, we can associate then a local operator algebra has von Neumann algebras. So first of all, we can associate them in this then boundary space so that this will be definitely on this A and this is on the A bar and that becomes a commutant as I was emphasizing earlier so that its double commutant will map back to itself so that it's going to be commutant to each other. And that's why it was very nicely usable for this holographic setup. Um, now, we should leader theorem then grants you that there is a vacua so that there will be a cyclic and separating state for this uh, very fundamental algebra we had, as then it will be the vacua of this boundary conformal field theory that's lying onto this region of capital A. Then the holographic map can be given as this isometry so that it maps from the uh, code subspace to the uh, physical Hilbert space on the boundary. Then what can we really utilize to understand here? 
Well, so we can explicitly incorporate the quantum channel, which is the one that incorporates these uh, isometry explicitly, so that when you're having this A, it goes to a V dagger AB as like in quantum mechanical setup. So that uh, quantum channel is nothing more than normal, unital, completely positive map. And that incorporates this holographic um, setting up between the two so that we can map from the bulk to boundary or vice versa. As And the vice versa is done by the complementary quantum channels to do it in the reverse fashion in the, uh, this complement setup. So what do we know about this one over, one over G Newton exact setting? Well, when you have these maps and can have recovery channel to map it the other way around, it'll correspond to the holographic conditional expectation so that it traces out the degrees of freedom. Meaning it can map from boundary to bulk as the von Neumann algebra from this region to this region, and that can have an explicit map between the two through this isometry. So that that can be taken as exact map that we can really have. Now, how do we incorporate then beyond this to have approximate recovery setting? From Hayden and Pennington, who looked into finite system explicitly, they introduced a notation called reconstruction wedge, which is given as the intersection of the entangled wedges of this capital A region of the boundary with respect to all mixed states in the code subspace. As I was emphasizing, it's no longer pure. You have to consider all mixed states so that we take into account changes of this, uh, um, this uh, Ritaka and Nagi surfaces from that setup. So we can think of it as similarly, but we don't have a Ritaka and Nagi formula, but we know that such a quantum extremal surface concept will shuffle around. So we can try to understand from the uh, perspective as this holographic map, what can be a resolution to that in this operator algebra setup and infinite dimensional setup. Our resolution is now going through a purification. So it's like a similar to thermal field double construction where you double the Hilbert space, you can do something very similar. So that we can introduce a copy of a code subspace and then double it up. Now, this can be done through the GNS representation that to recreate and then do the expected purification. And this is possible for any KMS, which is faithful normal state. That's basically the vacua, which is a cyclic and separating state that can lie on this uh, very uh, field theory. So what it really do is the bound of set that can be done in the uh, code Hilbert space, which is the bulk setup, then it can be purified directly into uh, this double description. Whereas uh, this new doubled system that we are taking, this part is explicitly finite. Now, how do we really understand that is that we are choosing this to be a finite dimension of arbitrarily large dimension here. So that, but this will not actually change physics because being able to uh, join an arbitrarily large reference system to this H code here um, will be enough to guarantee a state dependent approximate recovery. So that uh, this basically amounts to giving an arbitrary, precise approximation to an infinite dimensional copy of this H code. So that effectively, you're also allowing um, from the uh, operator perspective, they can deal with explicit copy of the system that can be taken as a reference system. So the other way to describe that is considering a normal state in this now uh, doubled system with the this augmented uh, H code star, um, we can associate the entangled wedge algebra that's onto this and the complementary region with the now new reference system can be done explicitly in the manner of augmentation so that from here we can have now two different entangled wedges. And um, by, by compositing like this, now we can have the intersection of all possible things as reconstruction wedge here so that we can now have a region A, which is smaller, of course, because it's only the intersection of all possible ones. And now we can have a reconstruction wedge instead of integral wedge for this explicit setup. Then- Am um, I can I ask something, uh, two questions. Uh, so one thing here is in the original setup is the, the, what's the assumption, uh, I mean, it's crucial is, uh, that there will be also complementary recovery possible. Ah, the original setup was a uh, complementary recovery to be possible was the uh, integral wedge 
region of the block reconstruction. Now what you're having is that you actually require to have this H code star as a reference system. That is basically a finite duplicate copy of this infinite dimensional code subspace. And now this is allowing us to take reconstruction wedge so that we can associate these entangled wedges through this with the doubled copy of the protocol. And then by taking intersection of all of them, because it was a mixed state, now it's purified, we can do that. And this mm. part will allow every of complementary recovery to be possible in this very region. Okay, so now you're saying the complementary recovery should still be possible if you are, if you are also in, if you are also tensoring with the finite dimensional space. Uh, right, if I but uh, yes, but with the so this is the setup. So that mm. this is the first setup that we're gonna allow, but mm. we haven't really taken into uh, full gravity yet. So we're going to allow it to be having a little dissipation, which will be having gravitational order, which is coming. We're not completely done I, yet. I understand. And and if I understand also correctly, the reconstruction wedge should also be the entanglement wedge of the maximally mixed state in this course of space. Uh, we'll get there. In fact, we're going to start from the uh, relative entropy as a now modified version because we need to take the reference state account. So that we're going to have a modified the GLMS formula basically oh, okay. with the uh, reference system together as a generalized entropy. Mm. And then from there, we're going to allow uh, gravitational um, air to come out. So before jumping in there, let me explain a little further of how we can really do this. So from here, we really need to have a uh, something that was mapping from anything coming from the H code operators to uh, this complement, because that has to be always guaranteed. And so that should be possible to be done to the boundary as well. So that we can always be given with the uh, projections of that to be possible. And that was the conditional expectation. And for conditional expectation to be exist in this setup is that when this MA is purely atomic with the product of type one factors. I really want to emphasize that because this is a uh, uh, having additional structure and it's uh, not possible in full generality. Now, why is that really uh, slightly res restrictive? Is that um well then just to ask then this MA prime to have uh, type one, it's not the same thing because not every direct integral of type one factors can be written as a product necessarily. Um, but if you're taking, so we have to do the sanity check. What does that mean back in the finite case? Well, in finite dimensional von Neumann algebras, as well as every finite or countably infinite direct sum of type one factors will satisfy this prop property always. So in turn, uh, all the finite case is still okay. And it's taking further of the infinite things account. And this is in the bulk. So boundary can be any von Neumann algebra of any type. And the bulk is the, as a code subspace we're taking, will have this restriction to be possible. Now, it may not be so shocking as you we were seeing Faulkner's papers that was taking to be only possible in the type one factors. And what it really means is that maybe that uh, this holographic map for the subspace we're taking in the code has to satisfy this to be really a bulk reconstructable is what we're really learning for the semi-classical bulk dual. Now, by taking this row state as a normal state on this now augmented system, which includes this reference, new reference system, then we can take that as a, a augmented version to take it. So that it's a state on this uh, boundary, I mean, boundary prime here with the uh, additional reference system together. And now we can apply the relative entropy conservation with the uh, dissipation of the gravity, which I'm gonna call modified uh, JLMS formula. What that means is that this is a generalized entropy term and that's the explicit entropy term. And uh, this is from the bulk and this is for the boundary. So that you're really just taking off boundary to bulk. And uh, it's usually absolutely zero in the order of one over G Newton. Now that it's having gravitational corrections that's non-perturbative, it needs to have this epsilon that's non-perturbatively non small in G Newton. That can be written as obviously exponential to minus G Newton with the positive coefficient. Now, 
what do we really can get from looking into this uh, relative entropy, qu not quite conservation, but the you know, uh, gravitational error to dissipate its uh, relative entropy to be identical, is that, well, first we need to look into the entangled wedges that we're really taking. And this one is the entangled wedge of the boundary region, this A, and the reference system that was coming from the augmentation, so that we had explicit this augmented bulk state that we looked into as that's the part that we had to really consider. Then this region in the bulk is the, uh, is the uh, complement of the intersection of all entanglement wedges, which is this reconstruction wedge. And that's the explicit complement of that in both the pure and mixed states uh, in the boundary of capital A. That means no matter how you choose the state row, this particular entangled wedge region is always contained in this uh, complement of a prime with the reference state, a reference system. So then the state row and then the augmented state will always coincide. So that's a zero, meaning there's no difference in relative entropy. So that's already shorter. So what do we know about the next two terms? These are the generalized entropies of the two states of this and the augmented state, the identical state to be considered, so that it has the area term and the bulk correction term. So we already understood that these two states actually coincide on the entangled wedge of this complement of a bar and union of the reference state for the all states, all pure and mixed states. So they give rise to the same quantum extremal surface. So generalized entropy would absolutely be no different as we know that when having same quantum external surface, their terms are always identical. So what we really end up with is a simply just the first term bounded by uh, this gravitational error of dissipation. Then we can apply Penske's inequality, which takes directly out of the states that we are considering to be bounded proportionately to the uh, error that we considered that's non-perturbative gravity. And this is true for all normal states row. It didn't matter about what type of state that is. So that we can simplify further, that it'll just say about what projections and uh, complementary channel that we're having to be uh, really bounded here. Now, we're gonna come back to this with the switched gear because we need to now understand this from a completely bounded norm perspective. So completely bounded norm sounds very mouthful, but it's not really complicated. It just means that uh, when you have the von Neumann algebra, so you can always write as a supremum of all possibility of this uh, thing so that it's, it's a simply just a bounded linear map that picks the supremum. And the quantum channel that you're taking is in this holographic map we took is always completely bounded. And this is a proof that's done by uh, lovely mathematicians back in the days. Now we're going to understand the privacy and correctability as a concept to go back to what we left off to understand about this coming from the JLMS modified version of the formula. So we are given with the quantum channel always in this holographic setup is basically the setup we worked with in this setting. Um, then we can have a private channel defined to be identical to this. So in, in human work, that means that none of the information it contains is really accessible from the domain of the quantum channel. So in the earlier setup, this is how we got the quantum channel. With the isometry V, we just map it like I'm just quantum mechanical thing so that we can map it from this boundary to this block. So in ADS exact setting, ADS CFT exact setting, then this bulk algebra A, so this region will be then entangled wedge. And then this will be the bulk algebra in here as MA will be private with respect to the, this complement of A, A bar, for the usual boundary to bulk map, which was the quantum channel we looked into. Now in approximate setting, we're gonna take this as a reconstruction wedge instead. So that we have now not complete one, but it'll dissipate with the epsilon. So we need to look into epsilon privacy of this quantum channel, which means that now we can have this privacy channel that's having this uh, norm of the epsilon and note that this is written in the CB norm. CB norm is basically like taking as a Heisenberg picture of the uh, diamond norm, if you know 
are familiar with the diamond norm as a context. So from here, this epsilon, that's the non perturbative gravity term, and that amount of the actual information it contains is then accessible from the domain of the quantum channel. Now, what is a correctability? Correctability means you can have a kind of like an inverse, so the recovery channel is possible. So it's keeping the recovery channel and then keeping this uh, to be exact. So in the exact setting, what does that mean? That means that this region that was an entangled wedge, which is this small a, um, corresponds to the existence of the star homomorphism of the map between the von Neumann algebra here to the boundary von Neumann algebra. Now, in the approximate setting, likely you have to consider with the epsilon non perturbative gravity term. And that means you're going to have now dissipation of epsilon. That's not exactly identity, and it's having a dissipation of epsilon that's off from before. Now, here comes the amazing theorem that seemingly looks absolutely the opposite almost, is dual as a statement by Kron, Cripps, Levine, Todorov. It's that when it's epsilon private, it is two square root of epsilon correctable. In the reverse way, it's slightly different factor, but it also works. So when you're putting the epsilon equals zero, which is the exact setup we want to really work with, um, we actually recreate then the exact setting corresponding to the Dong Harlow wall statement originally. And um, what that really means is that uh, um, in the holographic setting that we can actually look into the case of the finite dimensional perspective, then it indeed provide the uh, exact relative entropy conservation is what we will eventually get. And by having this as epsilon equals zero, it'll explicitly recreate that theorem. Now let's go back to where we left off, which was exactly this coming from the uh, modified JLMS formula of the relative entropy with the dissipating of epsilon. Now, as we just learned, the quantum channels are always completely bounded. And using that information, we can remove these augmentation and we can grab this back as originally. Now, what do we know more about this? This uh, reconstruction wedge von Neumann algebra here is private for this explicit quantum channel as that's a complementary on the A prime region. So then what we know is that this is explicitly that in this spirit of two epsilon private for this complementary region. So then now putting directly the duality we just learned between privacy and correctability, what we get is this, so that there exists a recovery channel that is explicitly bounded with this much, so that it's correctable with two times uh, two epsilon to the one fourth. So that we have an explicit approximate recovery as if this was zero, that's a complementary recovery. So that it's explicitly depending on the uh, gravitational error term, but instead of, just on its own, it's to the one fourth. So what we really achieved thus far is that from before we had a complete complementary recovery as the exact the uh, entangled wet reconstruction to exact uh, relative entropy conservation between bulk and boundary as a JLMS formula. Now we are tilting up with the approximate version of the theorem that has non perturbative non uh, gravitational error which is written as this epsilon, that's basically epsilon is exponential to the minus g newton with all the positive coefficient um, that you can deal with, then uh, it's allowing with the uh, this gravitational order of this much and the power of one fourth vice versa is equivalent so that we looked into the modified JLMS formula with this dissipation. And this is what we eventually got, other three terms were zero. And that's if and only equivalent to having explicit existence of recovery channel with this as the error, error bound to have. So that now that we can have certain version of that with different uh, powers of uh, gravity based corrections, we can probably ask then, uh, what can you utilize this further beyond the reconstruction wedge as those are explicitly applying within the reconstruction wedge. Now, some observables are not explicit in the reconstruction match, such as uh, like black hole interior, because it cannot be reconstructed in a state independent type of manner. 
as those are the only ones that can be done within this reconstruction wedge. The boundary uh, represents. Uh, sorry, before we go to, before this uh, state dependent thing. So your statement that you made is also true for the complement. Uh, the, the duality so? between the duality right. between because this if you take epsilon to zero, just take zero and zero, it goes back to the exact setting. The exact same. So it will also work in the same way for the complement. Correct. Just take okay. epsilon exactly zero. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. So back to here. Now then, uh, we know the boundary, which is a boundary control field theory. Representatives are state dependent, so that you can have this context in the information paradox setup. So the idea here is that it's a little bit of a mouthful. It's not just a subspace fix, but it's like whose dimensions grow like a certain power of the dimension of the whole code subspace. So it's like relatively fixed in size, can be recovered inside a black hole. And this idea is really coming from Papadopoulos Fraju or Hayden Pennington uh, as uh, what can you really do for the uh, state dependent type of things. Now let's go back to then something you're more familiar with and then go back to the infinite dimension. So in finite dimension, we don't have a factorization problem. So we can factorize into the black hole segment and the ex external system, this exterior. And the, uh, we have an area dependence so that when you're taking this, uh, that's the dimension of the black hole. So they can take the log of them with the GN and taking with this limit, we have the area of the black hole divided by four. Then we can consider uh, two bulk regions with the boundary in this uh, specifically A of respective areas. So that we can have two different uh, regions. The first one is an entangled wedge for a pure boundary state so containing the black hole. And the other one will be an entangled wedge of a thermal boundary state and does not contain the black hole. So that alpha here, then we're going to consider as strictly smaller than one, meaning the uh, difference between the two, which will be basically the re relevant to the black hole existence. So that divided by uh, this black hole area, so strictly between zero and one. And that's a very reasonable thing to expect as long as the geometric and matter contributions are small outside of the black hole. Now, we know from Hayden Pennington that there's only two possible quantum extremal surfaces for this uh, entangled wedge, which is either this A1 or A2, as that's anchored around the region A. Then state independent recovery requires this A2, which is the one that does not contain the black hole to be dominant. So that what we really get is that the dimension of the subspace to decode is uh, bounded by this term, and that's the uh, black hole area divided by 4G Newton with the alpha. And alpha was the one that was explicitly determined as this, the difference between the two in respect to the area of the black hole, which is zero to one, strictly. Um, and this is smaller than the black hole dimensions. Ah, oh, that's unfortunate. It's strictly smaller is what we really get. So reconstructing black hole interior is then only possible in the state dependent manner. So now let's put that to infinite dimensional system with a similar philosophy of how I presented it. Now, suppose the black hole Hilbert space is now entangled with this as we had the uh, augmented system of reference system so we have to choose this reference system that we can deal with. And this will be the reference system for all degrees of freedom that black hole can be entangled with. And that should definitely include Hawking radiation. And this will be of the dimension of this with the alpha prime instead, because it's like H code star. Whereas this is strictly bigger than alpha before. Then we can construct a subspace. So we're gonna have a subspace that's within the uh, augmented system, so that this is H code, and this is the augmented system we took as H code star, now just called as this HR. Then the earlier one that we really had, that uh, can be reconstructed as the, uh, this is the complementary part of the uh, von Neumann algebra on the boundary, and this is the reference system operators. And we, we know that, that this can be reconstructed from this up to this epsilon as a non perturbative error, is what we learned. Well, let's apply the, uh, the um, um, privacy correctability form as this duality explicitly. Then 
this particular thing is a delta correctable for some this positive thing, as we can compute as this uh, error, then from this duality, it is a square root of delta private for the original MA cross identity, as this is augmentation in HR. So what we know is that it is explicitly impossible to recover the black hole interior if this alpha prime is bigger than alpha, which is the only thing that we can really have originally. So what we're really understanding is that as expected, the black hole interior is not really possible to recover through this uh, things, and it's explicit proving that to be the case. Now to summarize, so I've reviewed the exact relation that's true up to the order of one over G Newton between the entangled wet reconstruction and the relative entropy equality between the bulk and boundary. And then now we fix it up with the non-perturbative gravitational corrections this time. And that was encoded as approximate recovery with epsilon that's exponential to minus positive G Newton. And that one is true in generic all infinite dimensional setting for the boundary Hilbert spaces. And the, and the code subspace could be a large finite of a particular type or a infinite of a particular type of one element algebra for the code subspace. And we tilted around to take the intersections of all the entangled wedges to give you a reconstruction wedge a strictly smaller region. And for that, we recreated that to be possible with the privacy correctability correspondence that we can have a state independent reconstruction in this reconstruction match. And that is equivalent to having a modified JLMS formula, which is basically a JLMS with the reference state together from this uh, augmentation with the non perturbative gravitational corrections. And then we show that this reconstruction outside of the reconstruction match has to be explicitly state dependent. And we show that this proves basically how the black hole interior is not reconstructible in this format. Now, these can have many various interesting implications. So the setup crucially required this extra reference system. Without them, we couldn't do anything. That was the source of purification fix of the operator algebraic system. And um, for this to be proven in the actual proof, without them, everything breaks down. Now, integral much of this itself is, can be very non-trivial. It can significantly change our description of the bulk reconstruction. So the auxiliary system you're taking, which is H code star, can be identified with um, the space of semi-classical states of Hawking radiation, which is the thing that we took for the black hole interior, but also it can take as the space of semi-classical semi -classical states of the other boundary, so that we can have identification between the thermophile double states. And it should really echo that is not very so strikingly different as you're basically doubling up the system as this reference system. And of course, taking it the other way around is exactly a thermophile double type of system. And for that, we can understand as I go throughout as a wormhole in between uh, two different boundaries with the non-perturbative gravity corrections. So that this can imply with the setup of quantum extremal islands and the information paradox in this uh, particular format. Thanks for listening, and I'm happy to answer if there's any more questions. Yeah, thanks for the really beautiful talk. And uh, so let's have questions now. Okay, so, oh, Kunal has a question. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. So please ask. Uh, uh, I was wondering when uh, when you are taking the conditional expectation onto this code algebra or code subspace, the algebra generated by that. How how do you decide what should be the code algebra or what sort of algebraic structures you impose on that smaller algebra that is relevant for you? Ah, so uh, earlier for the complementary recovery, you're always taking a code subspace, which is the entangled wedge. So when you're having a particular, uh, let's go back to this, some, some diagram here. So when you're taking this region of this capital A, 
anything that's reconstructable has to be under this root chakra and surface. And that's strictly the entangled wedge in that original setup, whereas the new one is reconstruction wedge. So anything beyond that is not bulk reconstructable. And that's why this is the minimal region. And that's why we were studying what is possible on here. And for the uh, algebra standpoint, what that means is that the operators that form as algebra here is not reconstructable by this if it's strictly not uh, reconstructable. Um, so what structure I have is, is not really much of a, originally that was not much of an issue other than it's a von Neumann algebra that satisfy this uh, explicit holographic map as an isometry. And that isometry is imposed by allowing this to be ADS CFT. That doesn't restrict itself of the uh, algebra originally. Now for the reconstruction wedge case, what it really prohibited is that, I, I think I wrote it near here. Let's see, should be around here. Ah, here is that the boundary does not get affected. So boundary algebra can be anything, any type of the von Neumann algebra. But the insight for this reconstruction wedge to be having this conditional expectation, which is the holographic map you're really taking, um, it's only allowing a product of type one factors. Meaning you can have a single type one factor as a, some finite form of those or countably large many as well. So, and so that's the code theory, subspace you're taking. So this theory that you set up you can just do abstractly by choosing certain von Neumann algebras and factors, right? It's or, not uh, some random algebra though, because you need to have explicit conditional expectation to be satisfied. And that's explicit ADS CFT map. That's going to map the uh, operator to operator to be explicit. Oh, okay, okay. I hope that answered the question. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I wanted to ask something um, uh, about the last point of your talk. Do you, can you make a very precise statement about when islands should exist in your way of doing things? So, so it is, uh, you're saying that, uh, uh, of course, when the radiation subsystem is larger than this, um, uh, the, the 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 dimension of the uh, subspace, uh, mm -hmm. then uh, then you have an issue. Uh, but then um, could this be really turned into some more precise understanding of? Because there are similar papers being written by Arvin and others. I think Rafael Pope also on uh, some general understanding of when island should and should not exist. So yeah. Um... That's a very good question. Um, so it can be really understanding as, uh, so when the current one that's being cooked up, uh, we can understand where the, just basically playing with when this uh, auxiliary system can be put into, and it understands that when the island exists, it'd be when this is not really reconstructable, then it's not connected. So thus that's uh, separate islands. And, um, to be understanding more precisely, though, I would say it requires a little more precise understandings, probably better. And um, right now, it's matching basically uh, the thus far understanding of what Duso has. But um, I guess um, the operator algebra perspective to that to really understand better is. Um, we need to understand the form of what it can take and understanding of different possible reference system structure on top of that. So what type of operator algebra that it's really copying into and what that can utilize needs to be understand a little bit more um, other than it's just a something that we can do with the um, product type one factors and some truncation of it. Um, and uh, you're looking into them. Um, I guess there's a lot more exciting things to look into, but it's not giving a, uh, I guess, new 
limitations of when quantum extremal islands are possible at the moment. So in that in the sense you're trying to say you should you should ex exactly know how this interior is being encoded in the radiation that actual dynamics needs to be understood better in order to make the statement when island can exist eventually. Correct, correct. Okay, so that was very interesting and uh, yeah, it was quite uh, quite uh, quite nice to see how you could generalize this JLMS even if it's short. Uh, Usual challenge this thing. And uh, thanks for the beautiful talk. So, if, is, are there any further questions for Monica? Okay. If not, let's thank Monica again for this beautiful seminar. And uh, and then well, thank you for again. having me. Yeah. And if you have you any can... more questions, well, you already have my email. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we will we'll want your slides also. Please send your slides and we'll put it on our website. And, okay. Um, yeah, and, uh, so people can ask questions then also based on sure, slides. So. Okay, so that's all for now. And let me end the, end the recording.